Electromagnetic force is one of the four fundamental forces in nature. At the atomic and molecular level, it is responsible for properties such as friction, cohesion, and adhesion. At the macroscopic level, these forces are responsible for experiences such as touch and tension. Static electricity is the result of electric charge. Electric charge is the physical quantity that can be measured within an object. To keep them straight, we label one type of charge as positive and the other type of charge as negative. Most matter most of the time is neutral in overall charge because the number of positive charges is equal to the negative charges. But when certain materials are rubbed together, they can transfer charges between them. If you take a piece of silk and rub it against glass, the glass loses some of those negative charges. It now has more positive charges than it does negative charges and becomes positively charged. The silk, in turn, picks up the negative charges from the glass and now has more negative charges than positive charges that results in an overall negative charge. If you bring the glass back to the silk, the opposite charges will attract to each other. If you bring two positively charged glass rods together, those like charges will repel each other. Likewise, if you bring two negatively charged silks together, they will repel each other. To understand where the charges come from, we need to know a little bit about the structure of the atom. You probably already know that in a simple model of an atom, there are three main subatomic particles. Later on, we will see that there are several other particles created in particle accelerators, but they are rare and do not exist for long periods of time. So for now, we will concern ourselves with these basic three. In the nucleus, we find the positively charged protons and the neutral neutrons. Since neutrons do not have a charge, we can ignore them for a little bit. Moving about the nucleus of the atom are the tiny, negatively charged electrons. We have determined the charge on an electron to be 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Think about that unit for a second. If an electron has a charge of 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, then one coulomb is a huge unit that contains around 10 to the 19th actual charges. So it takes a lot of charges to make one coulomb. Within our atom, a single electron has a charge, little q, of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Now you're probably aware that nearly every object around you is neutral, meaning that it does not carry a charge. We also know that protons are positively charged. Protons also carry a charge of 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, but it is opposite in sign or positive. So the charge on a proton is equal in magnitude, but opposite in charge of an electrons. And except for some very short-lived, very rare particles, all charge in nature is carried by protons and electrons. As we saw with the silk and the glass rod, charges can be separated from the atom. Some materials simply have a greater affinity for electrons than others and can therefore take the electrons away. So when we rub silk against the glass rod, the silk pulls the electrons off the glass. The silk, now having more electrons than protons, becomes negatively charged. The glass rod, having fewer electrons than protons, is now positively charged. Now amber is a type of rock. If we take our silk cloth and rub it against the amber, something different happens than what we saw with the glass. Amber has a higher affinity for electrons than the silk, so the electrons will be stripped away from the cloth and attached to the amber. Now the silk has fewer electrons than protons, and so in this situation becomes positively charged. The amber, on the other hand, has more electrons than protons and therefore exhibits a negative charge. Note that the charges are not created or destroyed. They are simply moving from one object to the other. So the total charge in this or any other process is constant. Now we will get into some unique situations later on where charge and mass and energy are not conserved. But in our normal, everyday world, the laws of conservation still hold up. Friction is not the only way we can create a charged object. An electroscope is a sealed glass container with foil leaves hanging from a metal rod. The glass serves to insulate the foil from the outside since electrons don't really like to move around in the glass. Objects that really don't allow charges to move are called an insulator. The metal, on the other hand, conducts electrons through its structure very easily. If we bring a positively charged rod near the top of the electroscope, the negative charges inside the metal are attracted to it. 
This leaves the positive charges alone at the other end. The two foil pieces are now both positively charged, and so they repel each other. This separation of charges within a neutral object is referred to as induced polarization. If the positive rod is touched to the metal on the electroscope, then some of the negative charges move onto the rod in an attempt to balance the charges. This leaves the electroscope positively charged inside the glass. We can also do the same thing if we bring a negatively charged object near the metal. This will repel the negative charges and they will move into the ends of the foil, making the top of the metal a positive charge. Again, the foil pieces have the same charge, just in this case negative, and so they repel each other. Touching the rod to the metal will transfer the electrons into the electroscope, leaving it with an overall negative charge. One more method of charging an object is called induction. Take two neutral metal spheres that are in contact with each other. Bring a charged object close to one of them. This is actually very similar to the electroscope in that the charged object, in this case positive, will attract the negative charges to it, creating an induced polarization between the two spheres. Since the two spheres are in contact, the negative charges from the far object make the journey over as well. This leaves a lot of positive charges in one of the spheres and a lot of negative charges in the other sphere. If the two spheres are then separated, it leaves one positively charged and one negatively charged. You can also charge by induction with only one sphere. In this case, you need a ground. A ground is simply a wire that is run to something that has a large supply of electrons. We call it the ground because we can attach it to the actual ground on the Earth. Earth is pretty big and we could consider it an infinite supply of electrons. So when we bring the charged rod next to the sphere, the negative charges are attracted to it. Since the sphere is grounded, the electrons can move through the wire to the charged rod. So the sphere ends up with more electrons inside it than when it was neutral. Then we can cut the ground wire and take the charged rod away and we are left with a negatively charged sphere. So neutral objects are actually made up of movable charges and can take on charge in three ways. With the amber and the glass, we gave the objects a charge by stripping electrons from one of the objects. We used friction to move the charges. And then in the electroscope, we touched a charged object to a neutral object. And we then used the idea of polarization to charge objects by induction.